conference. So I'm totally prepared, but I had to prepare a day early. And I had to prepare multiple stuff. So, But that'll be on YouTube, too. So that'll be good. Um, let's see, do I have my... Anyway. I'm going to go right into the Greek words of the day. My black's going on. I need to get another black thing. i got to dig in my... Judy has, has given me a bunch of those, so I just have to dig in my uh, my bag of, of special <laughs> special markers. I love to have these markers. They're great. A-K-A-N-T-H-A. Akantha. Akantha. Uh, this is a word translated... For, uh, thorn, and we're going to see this in the text in uh, when we get to 13, where the parables. You could probably guess where it comes, but it's translated thorn, but it really doesn't mean thorn per se. It, it means, it comes from the word acme. And if you remember acme, an acme, what's the word for priest in uh, Greek? Um, I can't remember right offhand. Anyway, the high priest is called the acme priest, right? And a thorn is the acme, the point. So in Greek, do you see this is, uh, this is a word play? It's a pun? Anyway, we're going to see that pun. <clears throat> you, you know, okay. Well, this word is in our text. M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. This, is the word, this word is used more times than ecclesia in the New Testament documents. It's used more times by Jesus Christ than you can imagine. It's used in Matthew in chapter 13. It has to be translated secret. However, there's a whole bunch of other words translated secret. The word, another word translated secret, uh, E K G R U U P T O. Ek ek grupito. Let's see, is that, got that right? Ek grupito. Ek grupito. If you remember the word to conceal, to hide, is. Uh, uh, crypto, or crypto, crypto means to to unconceal. Uh, if you remember apocalypto, apocalypto, crypto, there's, these words are related. They come from the same form. And so to this word means specifically, it's used, it's translated in King James to hid in, hid in, but it means to conceal. We're going to see this word. Yeah, let's see this other one. Which one is the other one that means conceal? Anyway, if you remember, well, we'll see it when we get to it. But why would you translate mysterion? Mysterion means, and I can never get away from this. We can never get away from this. Because mysterion in Greek means, literally, the silence imposed during an initiation ceremony. And what it means in Greek is it means, if you remember that, that evolution <coughs> of religion, so... When we talk about the evolution of religion, we have, you know, the animism, we have uh, paganism, pantheonic paganism, we have mysterion and Gnosticism. This is what it means. So whenever you see this word, it does not mean secret, it does not mean hidden, it does not mean concealed. It always means the mysterion. And that is a specific Greek form of religion. So, it's significant that Jesus Christ uses it. Merrick, this is the second time he's used it in Matthew. Um, we've had this word, not in this class, I don't think. Uh, poneros. Poneros. Poneros, we get pornography from it. Uh, it's translated many times evil one, which is not really correct. Because poneros means, um, it, well... It, it means to be hurtful in effect or influence as an essential kind of character, as a, uh, uh, a character. So as, as, a, as a character of a person, of a being. So, you know, it means like not necessarily intrinsic evil in a human being, but that's a different word study per se. But in any case, we'll see that. Um, got some good Z words. Z I Z A. N I O N Z Zitzenion Zitzenion uh, the Z sound in Greek is a T Z type sound Zitzenion um, this is the word for false grain now many times it's translated 
uh, weeds, but it means darnel. Darnel is a specific kind of plant that looks like wheat until it begin until wheat begins to uh, form the the ears or the heads. the heads. And so it, it's this is the word itinon. Um, another good one, z u m e zume zume. This is this is the word meaning to ferment. It's usually translated leaven. Um, in reality, people didn't have a clue what caused leaven to happen. And so it's really interesting. You know, we have, it talks about yeast and whatever. The Greeks didn't necessarily use yeast. They used fermentation, like sourdough kind of fermentation. And so to them, uh, it was a slurry pot, you know, like uh, sourdough bread. You make sourdough bread, so you share it around. They had no clue what yeast was. You know, we buy yeast, right? Packaged yeast. Nobody knew what yeast was. You just, it was sourdough. Um, and finally, we've had this word before. Uh, let's see, U R O S. Thesaurus. Thesaurus. Uh, we have a thesaurus. It's a word treasure. Treasure of words, right? It. This is translated treasure, but it's really not treasure. It comes from Theo and Themi. Theo, right? What's Theo? God. Thesaurus means literally a treasure set apart for God, for the gods. And this reason I bring it up again because we'll see it. So anyway, um, I want to go back to 12 because we kind of stopped at 12, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in 12. I do want to mention, I'll give, let's see, if I give, can give five minutes to Mysterion. Um, the place where we stopped before on Mysterion, <clears throat> because Mysterion, again, we'll see this in 13. And 13 is, I believe, the third discourse. I think I've got that in the... Now you have two, 13 is the third discourse? Yeah, 13 is, is, I believe, the third discourse. And the fact that the third discourse includes Mysterion is pretty interesting to us because, okay, um, remember the place kind of where I stopped before, as I said, we recognize the mystery Mysterion today in groups that look like Mysterions or, or actually are Mysterions, for example, Masons. Um, some other groups that do those kind of, of initiation rites in secret, secret initiation rites. Yes? All, all the whole Greek system colleges. Yes, the Greek fraternity system. It, that's precisely right. So if anybody was, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you're a frat or sorority, the Greek system is very similar with initiation rites, hazing they call it today, right? Um, that's, that is not far off. And did you wonder where they got it? And also, why they use Greek letters and symbols, okay? This isn't a conspiracy. This isn't the bones thing, right? Uh, what do they call it? The bones Stolen. society? Although, it, that is a mysterion also. Skull and crossbones, that's a mysterion. We find evidences of mysterions all the time. People don't take them seriously as much as, like, you know, they don't usually see them as a religious type of thing. But there are religions that are mysterions. Any, any type of religion that requires a secret initiation, where the initiates are kept in secret as to what is the, um, you, you know, what is the secret, what is the, what is the knowledge that is kept secret and only given to members that have gone to certain parts of initiation. So if you can, you know, think of religions or groups or people that do it that way, that is mysterious. It's, and you notice, Christianity, we will find, have, has great aspects of a mysteria, especially in the Greek sense. But guess what? It's not a mysteria. Are the initiation rites of Christianity hidden? Mm -hmm. right? They're specifically in the open, right? You're, are you baptized in a cave? No. No. no, you're baptized in the open. As a matter of fact, isn't that interesting? That's the difference between the Greek uh, Mishnah or the Greek um, Mikvah, where the Greek or the Jewish Mikvah where the mikvah is done in nudity, you're nude, and it's done privately. And no one is there to do it to you. You are there with a mikvah lady or you know the priest watching to make sure that you're totally immersed. Where the baptism of John, which was a mikvah with him overseeing, was done where? In the open. In the open. And people were probably naked. Remember, Christian baptism was probably done nude and you can gather a lot from that, too, because that's very Greek. But compare that. Contrast and compare that to the culture. 
to the society. What about the Jewish culture, where nudity was entirely frowned upon? You know, one of the big things we think, and there is not a lot of data for this, but one of the things we think is the reason that we had, you know, deacons and deaconesses, deacons were, deaconesses were deacons' wives, and the priests, like for example in the Greek Orthodox system, the priest's wife is a matutska, I said right, matutska, her job is she, she takes care of the women in an Orthodox ecl ecclesia. So the priest's wife has a job that is spiritual in nature. So you have bishops and bishopesses, the wives of bishops. You have pastors and pastoresses, so to speak, deacons, deaconesses. And what do you think the deaconesses and the pastoresses and the, the bishopesses, if you want, did? They probably baptized the women, right? Because remember that separation in Greek culture between men and women and in the Jewish culture? So would you want to have your wives being baptized in the nude by this guy? You know, of course not. So, and, and if you remember when we talked about Corinthians, remember that they had a um, all Jewish, matter of fact, go now to an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. There's a separating wall. The women are on one side, the men are on the other. In Lutheran churches, the women used to be on one side and the men on the other, right? Mm -hmm. That separating wall. That's what they talk about in Corinthians. And so probably li probably likewise, the deaconesses mm -hmm. and the pastoresses and whoever else's esses, the wives of the leaders, were probably on the other side and were managing the women and teaching the women and looking after the women. So, you know, culturally, this is a very important thing in that, in that society. And it's very interesting because we have not retained those remnants very much, right? We don't, we don't view the world that way, but that's a pretty healthy way of looking at it to some degree. I mean, I just put, throw that out. For example, the idea in the ecclesia that the wife of the priest looks after the women's needs. You know, that way you don't have to, a woman doesn't have to go to the priest to try to, you know, explain issues that she might have. So, yeah, very, very healthy way of looking. Anyway, in classical antiquity, we have the mystery cults, the mystery, the mysterions, the cults. And you've got the Eleusia mysteries, the Dionysian mysteries, Orphic mysteries, Mithric mysteries. I've got a list that's probably a mile long, but these are specific ones in classical antiquity. Um, I've mentioned before that Christianity took over most of these mysterions. When we see evidence of that, I'll point it out to you. We're going to see more evidence of that in the parables, the, the th third discourse in 13. But what's specially important to note for us is that, you know, as I mentioned before, they named themselves after the heads, the god, either the god or the head. So therefore, <coughs> Teen Hodos was called in Antioch? Christian. Christian, after Christ. So the Greeks acknowledged Christianity as a mysterium because that's why they named it Christian, just like the Lusian, the Dos, uh, Dionysian, the Orphic, the Mithric, the Pythagorean, the Sophoclean, Mysterions. Matter of fact, the Masons, Masonic. Very interesting. Anyway. Maya, yeah. Did, did the Greeks ever have organizations or activities that were not Mysterions? It's all we talked about is a large list of those. And it seemed to me like they almost have an inclination to categorize a group as a mysterium because that's what they're accustomed to. So they just attach it that way because now they think they can understand it. Well, if it looks like it, remember? Um, they did have other groups, but what you say is exactly right. To the Greek, and this is something that we've really missed, I believe, in our kind of learning about the Greeks, is we assume that the Greeks, we have this view of the Greeks, you know, that we get uh, from our, our elementary school and our school training, which is really not exactly correct, because we see them in the myth cycles, which is a very appropriate way of looking at them, and we hear about Athens, right? But how many really learn? I mean, uh, I know this in the Calvert School curriculum, they had them read um, about the, the boy from Athens, uh, whatever his name was. They have a book, there's a really short kid's book, where you actually get some taste of the culture, which is really neat. But in general, we don't really have a strong taste for the culture. And by the way, you know, 